All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. And this is our, our final class in the 700 line Pranyaparamita Sutra, otherwise known as Manjushri's Discourse on the Perfection of Wisdom or on Pranyaparamita. I, I, say, I say that it's our last class and not our eighth class. And I say that for a reason, is that I, I, I really, this is kind of playful, I'm being playful already, but it is, it's to get us in the mood for, for what's to come tonight. But rather than looking at tonight as the eighth, even though it is our eighth uh, class session on this sutra, I want to look at it as the, the one class that contains the other classes. So you could think of it as a summary class, but I just want to have a little fun with it sort of being a seven, because 700 line sutra, seven sessions, and then the one session that contains the other sessions. So, so just a little fun uh, playfulness with inclusive numbers there. Um, and yeah, and I have a few preliminary remarks to say about the sutra as a whole uh, before we look at tonight's topic, which is this really interesting idea of samadhi. The first thing I wanted to say just to start us off is I've made so many references to the ellipses in this English translation of the sutra that we've been reading. And those ellipses, of course, indicate that they've left things out. And I kind of keep, at this point, I'm railing. I keep railing on this text for leaving these things out. And you know, somebody asked last time, like, D don't they explain why they do that or whatever? And I, I don't know, I was like, I don't know what my answer was then, but I reread the preface or their prologue, and indeed there is a note. We made, this is an editorial note, we made some deletions in those sutras, which have portions that are extremely prolix, repetitious, or insignificant in our view. <laughs> wow, <laughs> sorry. Um, so most, and then they say, most of the deletions involve only a few sentences, but in a few cases, a page or two were left out. All deletions have been have been indicated the same. That's my insertion. All, all deletions have been indicated by the insertion of three ellipse points in the appropriate hiatus. So there we have it. There is the rationale for why to leave these things out. That the editors found them either prolix, repetitious, or insignificant. So I don't even think I really want to deal with that last editorial choice, <laughs> we deem this insignificant, uh, amazing. But those first two, uh, prolix, right, which means sort of like overly wordy and repetitious. Uh, have you read a sutra? <laughs> have you read the Dharma? Do you, you do know that they are repetitious and extremely prolix, right? And so I'm a little, and by the way, of course, I, I've been noting all of the different sections that they've uh, taken out and deleted, and I don't—I have yet to find one that is prolific. Or in it out, they usually involve uh, characters tend to be female saying things. So, anyways, I just wanted you to know there is that note to explain those those absences, but I, I kind of find that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, I don't know. There you go. There you have it. Um, the second note I wanted to point out is that I have been referring to the Edward Konza version. That's a translation from the Sanskrit. And just while we're talking about this stuff, I've mentioned before Edward Konza's other book called the Pranyaparamita Literature. And this actually is a bibliography of all the known Pranyaparamita sutras, of which, as I've said before, this is a whole genre of sutras. There are many, many sutras. In fact, this is just a little book of, of their titles, but I wanted to point this book out to anybody that's interested in this stuff because he also does a kind of short summary 
an, what it would be an annotated uh, bibliography uh, of each of the sutras. So it's kind of a nice resource, again, only if you're really into this Pranyaparamita stuff. And then if you're really into the Pranyaparamita stuff, there's a wonderful book called Pranyaparamita and its related systems, which is a collection of essays or studies in honor of Edward Konza, uh, edited by a former professor of mine, Lewis Lancaster, amazing scholar of Buddhism. Uh, so I just wanted to point those two uh, books out if, if people were like really into this Pranyaparamita stuff. Sweet. Um, otherwise, again, this is sort of going to be a, a recap of the sutra, a kind of winding down of this sutra. You know, I, I mentioned at a certain point, this, this Manjushri character is intense, you know, and this sutra has a certain intensity to it. Uh, that for me, somebody that sort of teaches, you know, these sutras really, I don't know, I get really into these sutras. So it becomes very intense for me as well to keep up with Manjushri. Um, and I wanted to, to point out about the, the, the 700 line version of the Pranyaparamita. There's a note in this book, whoa, sorry about that, regarding regarding the sutra that we're reading. And it's it gets pretty long at the end, and I'm not gonna go so far as to say it's prolix or repetitious, but it does get rather long at the end. And even before I read Edward Konza's note uh, this morning or yesterday, um, I was starting to get the feeling that there was like an original Manjushri's Praniparamita Sutra and that it's been sort of expanded and added on to. And indeed, he has a note that there is, um, and that basically the very first part of this sutra that I spent the most time on, that seems to be the kind of original sutra. Um, so I just wanted to point that out too. Um, yeah, and that's it. And otherwise, we're going to get back into it. Um, tonight's going to be an interesting night because I'm going to be talking pretty much all night about this idea of samadhi. I mentioned it right at the end of last class, um, that, um, the idea of it, and then mentioned that tonight we were going to get more into it. So this is going to be an interesting review, not just of the sutra, but it's going to be an interesting, uh, well, it might not be a review for you, uh, but it's going to be an interesting review of the very idea of samadhi, what's usually uh, translated as concentration or something like that, concentration. This is, of course, a big idea, uh, not just in Buddhism, but in kind of Indian philosophy, Indian yoga, you know, Indian religious practice. This is big. And so I want just to kind of spend tonight a little bit in the beginning to talk about the, um, I don't wanna say the origins of this because I don't know the origins of this by any means, but I wanna sort of talk about like the, the general idea of Samadhi and then a few different ways it's spoken about. And then we'll get into these kind of very specific samadhis that are mentioned at the end of the sutra. In particular, we're going to talk about this one. The the single practice, but actually it means the single array. And it's such a beautiful idea, this idea of a, a single array, the concentration of a single array. It's a beautiful idea. I want to really kind of lead us towards that and understanding that. And so I think it'll really help to do a quick, you know, kind of recap again of like, what, what's a samadhi? What's this idea all about? Right. Um, always nice to start with the etymology of these uh, words. I'm a big believer in etymology. Um, and so the samadhi is actually kind of two words together, sama and da. I used to think it was samadhi, d meaning to see. I was mistaken after more uh, learning. It's samada, 
da is like the root of our dar, dharma, da. It means to sort of hold or to have. And so sama, the prefix sam, S-A-M or sama in Sanskrit, it's where we get the English word same. It means same, equal, equalized. And so holding together, holding as the same is sort of the etymology of this samada to, and, and in particular, because it's samada, it's like gathering to hold together, bringing together. That's the literal etymology of it. But of course, the way samadhi is normally spoken about or translated, it's as this like concentration. But I think people get a little misled by the word concentration because they may think mm, like, like to concentrate because we use that in English. Like uh, you're, not, you're not focusing, you're not concentrating. Concentrating. And so people think, oh, I got to concentrate. And it's actually the, the concentration, it's not about your mind per se. It's actually a gathering together or a coming together of everything. <laughs> it's kind of a almost a collapsing in that sense of self and other. I'm going to get, we're going to get deeper into the ideas of what samadhi is. I'm still just dealing with it at, at an at a etymological level that we move from this samada to concentrate to this idea of a verb of per doing, doing samadhi or being in samadhi. This starts to get a little tricky as far as the, the way the grammar should work there. Of course, in Buddhism, just to jump ahead, they talk about entering a samadhi or entering one of these, um, Samadhis, entering one of these concentrations. So that's just etymology. Indeed, we are sort of talking about meditation. And we are also, this is sort of, I'm going to kind of segue us into a, like a larger history of Samadhi. We are also talking about a, a broad idea of what could be called yoga. But I don't mean just asana, yoga, downward dog, sun salutations. Asana uh, form or uh, posture practice is just one aspect of yoga. Of course, yoga, this is for, more for posterity, not necessarily anybody in the Zoom room. But of course, this idea of yoga, yoga mean, also means a bringing together, a yoking, a joining, a union. And you know, there's a lot of different interpretations of what that yoga union, yoke, yoking, what that entails or what that means. And of course, indeed, in a lot of, a lot of different traditions are different traditions because they have different ideas of what this means to yoga. Is it union or yoking with the divine, with Ishvara? Is it sort of a, about a, a, a dis collected mind all over the place and then a method of bringing that mind together a yoking a lot of different interpretations of this but the premier uh system for yoga is what is traditionally called the eight limbs of yoga the practice this is what would be found or at least studied in the system of Patanjali, Pantanjali, this sort of classic meditation yoga system. If you're not familiar with it, it's helpful to, to know a little bit about this sort of um, Ashtanga system. Even though Patanjali and the Ashtanga system, as, as I'm about to explain it, even though it more or less comes after Buddhism, the system represented in Ashtanga yoga is very much what the young Siddhartha went out in the woods to practice and study. And, in, and so there, before the Buddha was the Buddha, he studied a system like this. And the eight limbs or the eight practices 
of the traditional yoga system, well, it's sort of four and four, and I don't want to get too into this tonight. There's these four preliminary practices called yamas and niyamas, observances and um, avoidances and observances. These are sort of your ethical rules, but also rules of purity of the body and things like that. So those are yamas and niyamas. Then you get into your asana, a little bit of limbering up of the body, right? Then the fourth preliminary practice is pranayama, breath work. These are various breathing exercises that are sort of, well, they have a lot of different intentions, but usually they're designed to sort of bring the body to a more quiescence. Then you move into the final four limbs, which are pratyahara, withdrawing of the senses from the outside, and then dharana, holding, dar, dharana, dar, means to hold, hold an object, hold something in mind, trying to stay focused on that dharana. And if you successfully pratyahara, withdraw the senses, dharana and hold to an object, it can bring about our good old fashioned dhyana. Dhyana, this sort of peaceful trance-like state, absorption, something to that effect. So dhyana, our good old or jhana as it is in the Pali system, right? That's the seventh step in yoga. But the reason why you would pratyahara, dharana, and then dhyana is so that you could finally arrive at samadhi. Samadhi is indeed the goal of ashtanga. And the idea is that the, the practice of withdrawing the senses, holding the object, trance-like state is so that you eventually arrive at samadhi. And for many yoga traditions, samadhi is the goal. If you get into samadhi, that's yoga. That's the union. You did it, is sort of the idea. So there's a process leading to samadhi. Okay. So I want you to know that that in the yoga world, that again, that sort of just traditional Indian meditation systems, samadhi was kind of the name of the game. Okay. And as I kind of mentioned just a second ago, that for some traditions, that is release, moksha, liberation, again, yoga, union. And so at that point, what we're talking about in terms of samadhi, well, as far as it means samada, to bring together and hold, to hold as one or to hold as the same, what we're talking about is this sort of, well, this will be helpful for our later on, but when we begin these practices, we are in a dualistic mode, which is subject, object, me and the candle or me and whatever it is. And so then I hold the object, that's the dharana part, me and the object, but I'm focused on the object. And then with long enough concentration, still enough, one gets into this nice dhyana, right? But then you spend long enough in this trance-like dhyana, there can eventually be a union with whatever the object was. A sense of oneness is the way samadhi is described. Samadhi is sometimes even translated as union. And so the idea is, is that I could kind of have a trippy samadhi on a candle by sort of becoming one with the candle or whatever it is. But in the yoga system, you're, you're moving towards union with Ishvara, the Lord, God, the Supreme Deity. And so by concentrating one's awareness on God or Ishvara, one can eventually unite with Ishvara. And that is this kind of exalted state of samadhi in, that would be, again, a, a moksha liberation event in some systems. Any questions about that as sort of a background for samadhi?
I want to, we'll move it along now, move it along. Now we're going to start talking about Buddhist Samadhi. And right away, if you're a Dharma practitioner, I want you to think of the noble eightfold path. Wait a minute, eight. That sounds familiar, right? Wasn't, wasn't Patanjali system eight steps ending in Samadhi? Huh. The noble eightfold path also is a lot of like ethical rules, but eventually it's about right mindfulness. And then finally, the eighth step on the noble eightfold path is right, correct, or proper samyak, samadhi, right or proper samadhi. And there's a lot I could say about that. Um, there's a way in which you can teach, I sometimes do, there's a way that you can teach the Eightfold Path as also a series of requisites, meaning that you got to have your view right. That's the first step is right view, samya drishti, having the correct view of reality. And the idea is, is that if your view is wrong, well, then your intention, your samkalpa, the next step on the path, well, that'll be all messed up if your view's wrong. And then if your view is wrong, and then your samkalpa, your intention is wrong, then your speech is definitely going to be wrong, and then your action is going to be wrong, and it's going to be wrong all the way down. So there's a way that you can teach or learn the Eightfold Path as like, it's necessary to have right view so that I can make the right intention, so that I can speak right, act right, and keep going, right? to have the right livelihood, to have the right resolve or right effort in that sense, so as to bring about the right uh, mindfulness, sati or shmurti. But all of that is to allow for the right or proper samadhi. So again, there's a way of looking at the Eightfold Path as complementary to Ashtanga, the Ashtanga yoga system in that way. I want to take just a moment to address this idea of right, proper or correct samadhi. This is in a way a response to those other forms of samadhi, those other forms of union, union with the divine or union with a candle flame or whatever it is. There was a bunch of other samadhis or a bunch of other samadhi practices in the world at the time of the Buddha. And so he created this system, the Noble Eightfold Path, and then advised for the development of right samadhi. And I don't, I don't want to spend too long on what that means because that actually gets tricky because different Buddhist groups have different definitions of what right samadhi means. And I don't ever like to step on toes that way. And so I'm not going to try to exactly explain what that means. But for the most part, the right samadhi is, um, well, if I could just say it quickly, if I could summarize it quickly, the right Samadhi is the samadhi that is not an end or not a telos. So in the other system I was describing where you become like unified with Ishvara, like unified with the divine, like I said, in some systems, that's liberation. You're done. You made it. So all you have to do now is stay in your bliss of union with the divine. By all accounts, it seems that the Buddha was saying, yeah, that is not the right way to do samadhi, where you sort of just drift off into a blissful state and stay there. Right samadhi in Buddhism seems to have been more of a necessary practice to give the mind a much needed break from stimuli thought. And eventually, if I may just sort of transition out of the right eightfold path, in the Buddhist tradition, samadhi, the union experience, it's basically gets spoken about in the context of what are called the four 
formless jhanas or four formless dhyanas. So by, by naming them that, they are dhyanas, meditative absorptions in that sense. But these four formless dhyanas are also sometimes called samadhi because the first formless samadhi of infinite space where all there is is infinite space, the idea is, is that that is equivalent to that collapsing of the subject object experience. There's no more meditator meditating on something. There's this kind of collapse into just an experience of infinite space. So that's sort of the first step in the original Buddhist process of samadhi was sort of this um, dissolution of the world of form, delineated objects, delineated perception. And then again, just kind of giving way to this infinite space, which then gives way to infinite consciousness. Again, just a oneness. Uh, it's a union, a oneness of space, a oneness of consciousness. The third form of samadhi is a oneness of absolute nothingness. And then you get to the fourth formless samadhi, can, in some systems considered the highest, which is the samadhi or the state of neither perception nor non-perception this very non-dual, neither nor kind of state. And as I've mentioned in many of my Dharma talks, in the original Buddhist system, it was sort of understood that the uh, samskara, mental conditioning, if one is able to samadhi out, <laughs> samadhi out all the way, through space, through consciousness, through nothingness, to finally neither perception nor non-perception, where there's, well, even in the, in the stage of nothingness, there's sort of the complete cessation of mental activity. Upon that complete cessation of all mental activity, there's sort of this samskara wipe, a conditioning wipe. The mind has become so still that actually residual conditioning habits of the mind get sort of eradicated and one comes out of the samadhi of neither perception nor non-perception. One comes out of it with a kind of mirror-like mind, they say, that is no longer conditioned from the past and is completely responsive to the present, has no prejudice, prejudgment in that sense. And so the right samadhi, the whole point of doing it was to kind of clear the mind of all this residual guk. But the point is, is you come back, you come back to us, we need you. And so the idea is you come back from that state, clear, you know, again, mirror like mind and, and you are in the world, but now as a pure being, this is eventually what is, you know, uh, leads to our hot ship in that way. So, but again, that's sort of the old system. I'm giving a very long to somebody, again, only so that we can appreciate the beauty of this Eka Vyuharo Samadhi. Questions, answers, ideas, comments so far? Everybody doing good? Gnome's, Gnome's got it. What's up, Gnome? Um. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> you've, you've uh, I don't know if defined, but explained infinite space as being that from which things arise, that which makes, uh, I, now I'm not sure, yeah, that, that which makes things possible. And just now you were talking about it as the point of collapse of self and other, the point of union 
of self and other. I, I have a I have a vague idea how those are the same thing, but could you mm -hmm. say something about that? Yeah, I'd love to. It's always a good idea to to like think about space for a second. <clears throat> so I appreciate your your question, Noam. So no mention this first formless samadhi of akasha. Um, what's in and actually this will be really helpful to get our minds in a good place for for the samadhis to come. But this idea of the ayatana uh, base of akasha, the akasha ayatana, the base of space, sometimes translated as infinite space. As many of you know, um, I'm really big on this idea of akasha or space. Um, and in particular, I'm really big about making clear what they're talking about. As I say often, akasha or space does not mean outer space, does not mean black void of space, does not mean, um, you know, if I have it, you know, if I have my water bottle, it's not about, it's, Space is not anything. It's not anything. So it's definitely not outer space. It's not black void of space. Space is this very interesting uh, dimension or something like that of our world. And well, the idea is of space, if you haven't heard this before, is that well, you know, I have my hand here, right? And there's a way in which my hand <laughs> consists of fingers, right? And if I wanted to, if I wanted to separate my fingers from my hand in that sense, I would sort of start to need this space to do it because if there were no space and I don't, again, I don't mean the hollowness. What I mean is the conceptual space in your mind that allows for you to conceive of five rather than one. If it's one, if, if it's one, then it's occupying the same space. That is the very idea of this, that anything that occupies the same space as something else is the same thing by our conceptualization. And if all of a sudden you wanted to say, no, 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 not the palm, the fingers, you would, in your mind, make a space. Now, this is really subtle and, and tricky because where is that space between my palm and the finger? Is it right here? Like, where exactly is the space between them? And that's what I mean is that I don't mean space like hollow space. I mean conceptual space that is your mind separating this from this. Oh, look, I've got two now. I got two hands. And the reason why you would even conceive of them as two is because of all this separation. So what we're getting at here is that again, space is not anything. It is a sort of um, conceptual allowance and the mind, or let me use my words better consciousness needs space in order to conceive of anything right where's i got my um, my classic here somewhere this is my classic example of space my optical illusion of either two faces or the glass and so the idea is is that in order for you to perceive and therefore have, be conscious of the two faces, it necessitates the space. 
But if you wanted to conceive of the glass, you would need the space. <laughs> so space is what allows for objects to be and exist in your mind as separate entities. Actually, thanks, Noam, so much. This is going to be very helpful later on. So the idea is, is that my mind is like, ooh, look at that, which isn't this, which isn't that, and has space in between them all. So consciousness uses, needs, is dependent upon, you choose, but consciousness needs the space in order to then conceive of the things. So what is so subtly beautiful about the first formless samadhi, it's basically moving into a concentration, pardon the, pardon the expression, but moving into a mental state in which there is no objects, just space. And remember, space isn't anything. So what your meditation, what your mindfulness would be on, on is infinite possibility, infinite allowance. The, you're, you, it's like you're right on the precipice of being, but nothing is yet. So it's this infinite pool of possibility out of, out of which you could draw anything you want. Some hands, some fingers, fingernails, whatever. You could pull them out of space. But this samadhi, this subtle meditation is about backing up to just before consciousness pulls anything out of infinite space and is cool with just chilling in, on, infinite, the poss infinite possibility. Now, Noam, about the collapsing though, when I say infinite space, I mean it. I mean, there's no gnome meditating on infinite space because that would have been pulling gnome already out of the infinite space. No, no, we're right before that. So that's where it's this beautiful, peaceful, quiet space, right? Because there's nothing yet, but there's a feeling of, of you know, warm possibility of everything. So it's not a dead space at all. It's actually quite vibrant in that way. Just, just because we're here, just because we're here in the Ayatana, the base of infinite space, <laughs> The idea here is, is if you followed the way that I explained that, that consciousness needs space in order to pull stuff out of it, right? It, it like consciousness sort of uses or, or needs space and then in order to pull stuff out of it. Well, what happens when you move from the formless samadhi of infinite space to the next one? It's when you get rid of just the, it's when you get rid of the space and there's just the consciousness that would otherwise be pulling stuff out of infinite space, but you've relaxed it enough to where it's just consciousness on infinite possibility. And then you take away even the space, even that possibility to be left in infinite consciousness. Again, this is not gnome being conscious and it's like infinite gnome. No, it's much more quiet and subtle than that, where it's almost like the hum of the universe, right? That sacred om of the universe kind of thing that could then get engaged and start using space to make stuff again, but has already gotten rid of stuff, even gotten rid of the base of space and is just an infinite consciousness. And then when basically that residual hum of consciousness, which is by the way, what's going on in that second formless samadhi of infinite consciousness, they describe it actually as like um, tracers where it's like residual consciousness still kind of humming in the background. And so after long enough 
of abiding in infinite consciousness, that residual hum. And now you're in the samadhi of infinite nothingness. And when they say nothingness, they mean nothingness. And I, I often, when people ask like, well, what is it? What is akiganya? What is nothingness? I often ask, have you ever passed out? Have you ever been blacked out? Have you ever had time you can't account for? And if you, if you have had that experience where there's that gap where you have no nothing, yeah, that. <laughs> They're talking about nothing absolute total mental stillness, which if cultivated right and properly, then gives way to this neither perception nor non-perception. Can't say too much about that, but if you followed me so far about moving through that process, which brings a complete cessation to conditioning, the idea is, is that perception, normal perception is, is based on conditioning. What we perceive is our conditioning. The state of neither perception nor non-perception is this kind of, again, a mirror-like dynamic mind that is sort of much more uh, instantaneously responsive to reality and not so prejudged in that way. So neither perception nor non-perception is it's it's above, above my pay grade, frankly. So I give you the the best I can. So okay, we're almost there. <laughs> Questions, comments, answers, ideas about all of that. <laughs> I pretty pretty simple stuff, really. Okay, cool. So I wanted to now. We have one more step before we get to our new samadhi. All right. And I definitely need to allow the right amount of time. So here's the deal. What I described, the four formless samadhis, space, consciousness, nothingness, neither perception or non-perception, that's the original old school Buddhist formula. And if you've been coming to the classes on this sutra, this Pranyaparamita Sutra, in fact, all of the Pranyaparamita Sutras speak extensively of the idea of not abiding, non-abiding. And actually what they're referring to, without getting too complicated, they're talking about the old school Buddhist system where one abides in the realm of infinite space and then abides in the realm of infinite consciousness and then abides in the realm of infinite, you, you see what I'm saying? That there are these stages in which gnome or whoever is in the samadhi of infinite consciousness. He's not in the realm of desire, he's in the realm of infinite consciousness. The Pranyaparamita tradition that this sutra represents, and in many ways, the whole Mahayana Buddhist tradition, they're not really too into those ideas of abiding in those uh, meditative states. And, you know, just to put it simply or easily in that way, they seem to not to that way because it kind of reinforces and reaffirms the notion of an ego self being in space and time, what I call an axis in space and time. It kind of reaffirms that idea of, an, of being an axis in space and time. And now I'm in this samadhi and now I'm in that samadhi. And what did you do this afternoon? Oh, I was in the samadhi of infinite space. So this idea uh, is sort of like, when the Mahayana tradition wants to talk about samadhis, it's like they almost always want to be very, very careful in saying, who? Who's in samadhi? Nobody's in samadhi. Kind of an idea. Like, that's to be in samadhi. So I just want you to know that 
Well, basically, in the early Buddhist tradition, there's essentially these four samadhis. In the Mahayana tradition, there's infinite samadhis. You get all kinds of samadhis. And that allows me to kind of start to segue. The way that I think of Mahayana samadhis is a little different than that old school Buddhist way of actually doing a seated practice, closing the eyes, concentrating until one is experiencing this infinite space or infinite consciousness. My feeling about it is in the, in the Mahayana tradition, there's a way in which even just a few minutes ago when I was describing infinite space, insofar as you were trying to follow me and insofar as you were putting your mind in that kind of space, pardon, pardon that word, but in that way, insofar as you were kind of contemplating this very idea of infinite space, that is sort of, get, it's, that's the samadhi of infinite space. It's sort of like putting one's mind in on that idea and sort of meditating on it. Now, you could keep you could keep going with that, of course, if that makes sense. Like, it, it's not just like it's not. It's you didn't get into the samadhi of infinite space. I mean, you may have, but if you were if you were hearing me, then you were perceiving of something, and therefore not in that realm of infinite space. But my point is, is that from the old school Buddhist perspective, these states were arrived at basically through breathing and like calming way, 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 way down. In the Mahayana tradition, as evidenced by this sutra, these, these things can be achieved through thinking, <laughs> like through using the mind, not just subduing it with breathing into submission. All right. And so I say that because last time we were introduced to the inconceivable samadhi. This is kind of like in the Mahayana tradition, the inconceivable samadhi is like that's at the top, not the whole neither perception or non perception or anything like that. There's this idea that there's a a, a meditative state, a concentration, a collection of the mind. But rather than space or consciousness or nothingness, the, hmm, you know, it gets tricky because to say the object is wrong, but I'll say it anyways, but the object of your meditation is the inconceivable that which cannot be conceived, that which has no name, flavor, taste, image, sound, is completely beyond conceptualization. The idea is, is that to put one's mind there <laughs> towards the inconceivable and then to have some sort of like collapsing of subject object experience, but not Ishvara, not God, not space, not consciousness, but the inconceivable. Again, that which is utterly beyond, beyond, beyond. That's what, when, when the men in the samadhi of the inconceivable samadhi, and he says, no. <laughs> it's a great classic Manjushri answer, though. But what he was saying, is sort of what I was talking about is, you know, Manjushri is the, the king, or I should say the prince of not falling into the trap of reinforcing the self in that way. So the Buddha kind of addresses him by saying, wow, you're, you, are you in the inconceivable Samadhi? Because you're really talking like you're in the conceivable, in, in the inconceivable Samadhi and in proper inconceivable fashion, Manjushri says basically no, because there would be nobody to be in the inconceivable samadhi. So, okay. Everybody feeling okay? 
Okay. So uh, as you get, may have guessed, I'm not reading much from the sutra tonight, but this will be the first moment. So I'm going to dive back into our uh, problematic uh, Chang translation here. And so this is pretty much right after the point that I got to last time. Um, so if you were here last time, we're pretty much right after that. But Manjushri asks the Buddha, Manjushri asks the Buddha a great question. World honored one, what should one do to acquire Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment, the supreme unsurpassable enlightenment of a Buddha? What should one do to acquire supreme unsurpassable enlightenment quickly? Great question. The Buddha answers, if one follows the teaching of the Paramita of Wisdom, one can acquire Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi quickly, Supreme Unsurpassable Enlightenment very quickly. Furthermore, there is the, so he translates it, they translate it as the single deed Samadhi. A good man, a virtuous man, a virtuous woman who cultivates this single deed samadhi will also quickly acquire supreme enlightenment. So, as always, we got to do some heavy etymology first to really appreciate what's going on with this samadhi. So, it is the eka, which means one, vyuha or vyuho samadhi. This word vyuha, which in the this particular word is vyuho, but it's the same word. Um, so by the way, that's the Sanskrit, which I get from the, the Edward Konza translation. And he has actually a footnote about this samadhi and a whole thing about the Sanskrit. So that's where it's awesome that we have that translation. Because otherwise, the Chinese would be the single practice. Mm, this word deed is like really misleading. It's the single practice samadhi in the Chinese. And if you were to read that, you might drift off into single deed samadhi and you might drift off into who knows where. When we find out that it is the, in the original Sanskrit, that it's the Eka Vyuha Samadhi. Oh, that's not Xing, the Chinese, the character Xing. That's not the Chinese. Oh, how did that happen? I'm not going to get into how that probably happened. That's probably only of interest to a few of you. But I do want you to know that a Vyuha, this is a wild idea. It's sometimes translated as adornment. But in, in this context, the way that our good friend Edward Konza, let's get him on the screen. The way Edward Konza translates Vyuha is the, or the Eka Vyuha is the single array, A-R-R-A-Y. This is a, it's a great word. Not everybody's familiar with array. Um, the thing that comes to my mind because I worked in uh, radio for a long time is an antenna array. So if you know what an, an antenna array is, it is a collection of a bunch of antennas. It's an array, okay? So an array is a collection of individual things. There is another way of, it's not a way to translate vyuha, but it's a way to think of a vyuha. A vyuha is also like a bouquet and like an arrangement. So even the, our word arrangement, which comes or has an etymological relationship to array, an arrangement is the idea of a vyuha. And the reason why I mentioned the idea of a, a bouquet a bouquet of flowers, right? This is not, um, if, if, if 
you're thinking of the flower garland sutra, the flower adornment sutra. Yes, it's the flower, it's the vyuha. That's the vyuha, and it is like a bouquet. So this samadhi is on the single array. And so now we've got what the meaning of it is. The, oh, so then Manjushri asks, <laughs> always with the great questions, right? We're all honored one. What is the single array <laughs> samadhi? What is the single deed practice or what the single practice samadhi? The Buddha answered, to meditate exclusively on the oneness of the Dharma Dhatu is called the single array, single practice, single deed samadhi. So, so that is it. It's about meditating on exclusively the oneness of the Dharma Dhatu. Now the Dharma Dhatu or the realm of Dharma is an idea that we've talked about pretty much every night of this sutra. It has come up. It's a complex idea that I, I kind of almost dare not even begin to try to explain again. It's like, go back and see the other editions. You know, this, this realm of the Dharma, right, is a pretty wild realm. <laughs> and I think, again, rather than trying to explain the Dharma Dhatu in that way, I want to go back to the idea of the Vyuha and then this idea of like, well, essentially, it's like, yes, essentially, this is sort of a, a meditation on the oneness of all things. But it's, it's so much more interesting than that. And so I, 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 this is our, you know, this is our Shariputra. He's been there all every, every night he's been there freaking out like, what? What? No. Like every night he's like, uh, been the classic voice here of Shravaka that's like totally doesn't know what's going on. But of course, now in our recap session, he's finally figured it out. And so he is in the single Vyuha, single array Samadhi. And so I have him in his little thought bubble here with a little bouquet. Okay. But my point is, or the point here is if you think of a bouquet of flowers, right? It's one thing, yet it is made up of a bunch of flowers, a bunch of individual flowers, but the bouquet itself is one, right? That is sort of the essence of what we're talking about. The way that the bouquet is one, but is made up of these other smaller constituent parts in that way. There was a night many, many, many Dharma doors ago where I talked about these funny collections of words you know, books. So there's a bunch of them, but you put them all together and you get a book. Well then, I mean, I don't wanna turn the camera, but then you could have a bunch of books. But then those bunch of books could very easily fit in one library, <laughs> right? And so there's this way, if everybody's following me on that, you go from all the words, make a book, bunch of books, make a library, bunch of libraries, make a university, right? Type of a thing. If you put that together, that, the books analogy with this idea of the bouquet, 
the Ekya Vyuha Samadhi, the single practice Samadhi is basically sort of about viewing all of reality as one giant bouquet with nothing left out. So it's seeing all everything, including you, the perceiver of said bouquet, you're a flower in the bouquet too. And so it's this sort of viewing of all of reality as being one, but with this, it's, but with this very, very subtle, um, where everything, oh, how can I put this? You know, it's like in, in the bouquet, each flower stays that flower. It doesn't, you know, get smashed into the flower next to it. So there's this way that everything in a bouquet maintains its individuality or particularity. But in regards to the bouquet, it's, it's singular. So it's that subtle movement between the unity and the particularity, but then the, me the proper samadhi or the proper meditation on this, well, it's about that relationship, the unity. And there's a line, uh, I probably won't be able to find it. Mm, yeah, I won't be able to find it, so I'm just going to summarize it. But it basically says that this meditation, it's sort of neither a oneness nor a duality. So it gets, it, and the best example of that, and I don't, I didn't bring it with me, um, so I'll, I'll have to use an imaginary one, but imagine I had my mirror, my little round mirror that I sometimes bring in. And you can imagine, you know, looking, gazing into the surface of a mirror. And of course, if I were holding it up here to the camera, you could see all the little zoom windows of everybody, right? And the idea is there's a way of gazing into the surface of the mirror and you could see all the individuated objects in the surface of the mirror. Or you could take that weird step back and recognize that it's a monolithic whole, meaning the surface of the mirror that is. But it's not even that, it's not anything, right? The I mean, and, and I'm not talking about the physical uh, uh, mirror. I'm talking about the reflection bouncing off the surface of the mirror. There's a way that the mind can stare into it. And again, this is why I'm glad we took that little diversion into infinite space, because this is very related to that. It's about looking into the surface of that mirror and being able to be like, oh, look, there's Gnome. Oh, look, there's everybody, but they're all one on the surface of the mirror. This meditation is about focusing on or thinking about meditating on all of reality, including you, the viewer, including you, the experiencer, as everything as being like on the surface of a mirror where it's all very oddly not related, not just connected. It's like oddly, again, one monolithic surface, one monolithic whole, but it isn't anything. It's not a monolithic whole, right? You see what I mean by it's not a monolithic whole? So it's neither unified nor diversified. It's sort of, well, dependent, dependently originated in that way, dynamic, all of those things. So that's this, this single practice samadhi 
And again, I would really suggest that this is done not with your eyes closed necessarily. It's sort of a way of looking at the world. And the degree to which you sort of fall into that way of looking at the world as a monolithic whole that is not a whole <laughs> is the degree to which you are in the Ekivyuha Samadhi <laughs> type of a thing. <laughs> okay, questions, comments, answers, ideas about that. Yeah, I know. Um, the, the, the Samadhi, the four Samadhis in the, you know, four jhanas, four Samadhis sort of progression, I guess they are a progression, they're, um, are, uh, are a, a more Theravadan thing, right? If I understand correctly. And these Samadhis, this Samadhi and other Samadhis, the a samadhi of uh, of the inconceivable, the single rake samadhi. Uh, are they beyond those? And are how many are there? And are they in order? And yeah, it's a little hard right now. Maybe I'm not understanding this. This is the first time I've heard of it. But it's a little hard to see how this is sort of more. I don't know, exalted, difficult, farther out there than, you know, the money of the inconceivable. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Great question. Again, I'm so glad you asked. Um, it was something I sort of thought I might say, but just couldn't figure out a way to work it in until you asked your question. How, do, yeah, how do these relate? Um, the way that I feel about it, the way I teach it, and, and I think this will really help, Noam. The, all these samadhis, and you know, you've read your share of Mahayana Sutras, you've seen these other samadhis, the names get pretty wild. And I think that there's a way that, you know, the Mahayana is, is it's just more poetic than the Theravada tradition. It's more playful poetic. And so these are not more exalted, harder, more difficult, crazier. It's just a very different way of going of thinking about it. That's a little more fun and playful in that way. But again, the the poetry, though, of a single array and viewing all of reality as one single array is a, is a very special idea. And it's, it's not the same. So for example, there's another very famous Mahayana Samadhi. I forget the, it obviously has a fancy Sanskrit name. I forget the fancy Sanskrit name, but it's called the ocean-like Samadhi. And the ocean-like samadhi is a very famous samadhi because it's the samadhi the Buddha was supposedly in for three weeks, 21 days after he was enlightened. And there are descriptions of the ocean-like samadhi. In that samadhi, all of reality is viewed at as like a giant ocean in which any given phenomena look, a phone, or look, a pencil, is like a wave on the surface of that water. So even though the wave has distinction from the other wave, they're ultimately just all the ocean. And it's like, oh, look, the ocean of, of reality. Oh, coming up. And oh, here's this guy. So that is actually very similar to the single array, but kind of different. <laughs> It's got a little different feeling to it, <laughs> you know, where it's this, well, you know, it's kind of oceanic and moving and undulating and morphing and changing. So it just has a certain feel to it. 
And then this single ray or bouquet has a certain feeling to it. And if you get dharmic about it, again, it's like, oh, it's the same idea. But the poetry of it is very lovely. So, yeah. Question, Michael. Uh, yeah, Dean. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of like sort of chronological development of, of you know, the different kinds of, of Buddhism. Um, this idea of the bouquet or the array, do you think that that would be something that's somewhat specific to the, the, the Chinese forms of Buddhism where maybe there was an influence of the Tao? This sounds like maybe this would have some of the, the Tao ideas in it, or is this something that would not even be there? Like you don't need the Tao for this. You don't need the Tao for this. Okay. <clears throat> These ideas are definitely coming. Um, my scholarly estimation is they're coming out of Central Asia, not India, but Central Asia. Mm -hmm. Um, just because you don't see this type of thinking entirely in India, you do see it in Central Asia. What is interesting, Dean, on that is that the, the, the Chinese, the translation from the Chinese that we've been reading and the translation from the Sanskrit that we've been comparing it to, there are parts that are different. Mm. And what's interesting is that the Chinese edition gets a little more Taoist in that way. And the Sanskrit, of course, doesn't get anywhere near that. So it becomes interesting to see where the Chinese sort of um, da Taoified it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But your question is a good one because it's sort of the it's sort of the opposite, or not the opposite of the way that you were thinking, but it's it's that these ideas are already so Tao-like that the Chinese were like, ooh. Yeah, uh, it was uh, already. Sure, it's the, it's the opposite. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's they saw it like, yeah, this sounds like our stuff. And yep. so we're comfortable with it, maybe. Got In, it. Indeed, and from uh just an interesting insight a very interesting little philosophical thing so th there is this thing that happens especially in the pranyaparamita sutras and it is effectively oh i guess it's the double negative um which is it's like neither existent nor not existent okay yeah. so that nor not, which we, we would call like a double negative. Mm -hmm. What's really, really interesting is that not all languages allow for you to do that, like gr grammatically speaking. Hmm. Chinese though allows for the double negative in a very, very fluid way. It doesn't feel or seem weird. And so what's really interesting is that because Sanskrit also allows for the double negative. And when the Chinese got the Pranyaparamita Sutras, the double negative, the neither nor, flipped their lid. That from, if you study history of ideas in China and philosophy, the reason why the Madhyamaka uh, school, which is the school of Nagarjuna based on his three treatises. These are called the Sanlun, the three treatises school. They flipped at this idea of like, well, but basically Taoism was already kind of non-duality, but the neither nor is even beyond non-duality. As crazy as that seems, like beyond non-duality, the neither nor um, negation thing of the Pranyaparamita Sutras, the Chinese were just like, what? Like, that's crazy. Like, it really got them excited because they were so philosophically into those, that the, the gaps 
if you will, the non-duality gaps of, of reality, that when they realized through Pranyaparamita stuff that, oh, uh, dualistic, non-dualistic, surprise, it's a dualism. <laughs> and so you need to like further negate it. So neither dualistic nor not dualistic. It's like, that's Pranya, by the way, that neither nor situation. So are, are there any like relevant languages where the case is the opposite, where it just didn't work for because you can't the, the concept wasn't there in, in a linguistic area? You know, Dean, there is and I don't know. And the reason why the reason why I know any of this. <laughs> just a quick aside, the the the, the young eager graduate student Michael many 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 years ago was a part of a, a group of professors who were discussing this and it was from them that I learned about this uh, that not all languages uh, have the double negative and that Chinese does and that's why they really were able to translate these Buddhist ideas well and they mentioned the languages that don't have it and therefore sort of it, it they couldn't get the point across, uh, but I can't remember what they were. Okay. So apology for that. Still, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions, comments, ideas? We got a few more minutes. I got a, a few more things to read. Yeah. Cool. So, um, oh, and by the way, um, I think it's in the cones of book because he has that really good footnote on the Ekyavyuha Samadhi, he defines it as yeah, basically what I just said, but it's this idea of um, like, uh, it's about contemplating the uh, I don't even want to get into it. I don't even get into it. Don't even get into it. Just going to move ahead to what I wanted to read. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. So, everybody good? I want to read a part just to finish this off. So, this is um, sort of towards the end of the sutra. Uh, this is after they've discussed the single uh, array samadhi. Manjushri continued, if people wish to learn Pranya Paramita, the Paramita of Wisdom, I will tell them. <laughs> you listeners should not think of anything or attach yourselves to anything, nor should you think that you are hearing or acquiring something. You should be as free of discrimination as a magically produced being. This is the true teaching of the Dharma. Therefore, you listeners should not entertain the notion of duality, should not abandon various views which cultivate the Buddha Dharma, should not grasp the Buddha Dharma and should not reject the dharmas of ordinary people. Why? Because the Dharma of the Buddha and the dharmas of ordinary people are both characterized by emptiness, wherein there is nothing to be grasped and nothing to be rejected. If people ask me about the paramita of wisdom, that is how I will answer them. That is how I console them. That is what I will advocate. Good men and good women should ask me about this and abide by my answer without regression. They should know that I teach the characteristics of all dharmas in accordance with the paramita of wisdom. And then the Buddha says, excellent, excellent, and so on and so on. But I do find that last little bit that I just read, a nice summary, again, kind of a recap of these ideas. 
a big theme of the sutra has been Buddha Dharma versus ordinary people Dharma, right? And I, there was one night where, when I went over that idea of Dharma, that it's the idea of a teaching or even a science or a methodology. And so there's this idea of like regular teaching science, uh, electrons, protons, neutrons, you know, physics, that's like regular Dharma. And then there's Buddha Dharma. And of course, it's tempting to be like, ooh, Buddha Dharma. Oh, yeah, reject ordinary Dharma. Ordinary Dharma's lame, Buddha Dharma's great. But the whole beautiful, wonderful teaching of the Pranyaparamita is this teaching that there's no difference between ordinary Dharma and Buddha Dharma because they are both characterized by emptiness. And of course, emptiness is the grand teaching of this Mahayana tradition where all phenomena are ultimately at the end underneath empty. That's the teaching, right? But what they're always doing and it's what Manjushri is always doing is you never then wanna be like, oh good, that's the teaching, I've got it. <laughs> No, sorry, because it's actually, as, as he says, as he says, it's actually about not thinking of anything. It's actually not attaching to anything, right? <laughs> it, it Really. <laughs> so, you know, and so I, I say, I joke about this, but it's for real. I mean, it, because we're, this whole Pranyaparamita Sutras and all of the Pranyaparamita Sutras, this per perfect wisdom, it's about really, you know, putting the mind consciousness under the microscope and seeing how it works and seeing how it would like to cling to this and that and seeing how it so loves to differentiate this from that. And so when it says, don't do that, you know, don't cling to this or this or that, when you do the thing where you're like, oh, good, okay, I won't do, you know, I'll follow you, Buddha. It's like, oh, no, no, you missed it. <laughs> and that's the Dharma. And by, actually, I should be, that's the Sad Dharma. That's the wonderful, subtle, beautiful Dharma. That one that actually cannot be grasp or held, right? And that, you know, well, that's a teaching for another night. <laughs> Any final, last questions, comments, ideas, or epiphanies regarding this 700 line Pranyaparamita Sutra, Samadhis, They feeling good? When the Buddha had finished teaching this sutra, the great bodhisattvas and the four kinds of devotees who had heard this perfection of wisdom, this pranya paramita, began to practice it at once with great joy and veneration. The end. <laughs> there, we actually sort of kind of read the whole sutra. <laughs> all right um that's con basically concludes our fall uh series here on the perfection of wisdom um like i said at the top of the session manjushri and these sutras they have an energy they have an intensity um that i'm kind of ready to to <laughs> close the one. Um, I have next week's sutra in mind. Uh, I think I mentioned a long time ago that I'm basically just going to be doing the heap of jewels for our Dharma Door Sunday night. So this is some of the heap of jewels. Um, there's actually translations of other parts of the Ratnakuta Sutra, the heap of jewels sutra. There's translations other places. Uh, but I do think I'm going to pull one 
as much as I don't want to, I am going to pull one from here. Uh, um, I have a feeling I'm going to do, there is a sutra if in this book, if you have the book, there's a sutra called, what do I call that one? I forget what they, oh, uh, uh, the dialogue with Bodhisattva infinite wisdom. Um, Akshimati, I believe his name is. Um, he's a Bodhisattva that actually appears in the Vimalakirti Sutra. He has his own sutra in the heap of jewels. And I've been wanting to do that sutra for a while. So I think we're going to do that one. So you can get ready for that. Let's see, make sure that's the right one. Yeah, Akshamati Paripricha Sutra. It's a Paripricha, the questions of Bodhisattva. Akshamati number 21 in this translation. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to start on that next week, but you never know. So. And with that being said, I'm going to call it a night. Thank you all so much for being here and for listening to the Pranyaparamita Sutra.